My name is Rachel Spencer and I am an Associate Professor of Law and the Director of Monash Law Clinics at Monash University and a member of Sisters in Crime. Before I introduce our esteemed panel, let me thank the Sisselman Cowan Centre, Victoria University, which has partnered with Sisters in Crime for the past six years. Due to the pandemic, we are not holding the event at Victoria University as we usually do. However, thanks to Zoom, anyone anywhere in the world can watch this YouTube broadcast. We hope you enjoy it. At the outset, on behalf of Sisters in Crime Australia, we acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Thank you. With me tonight, I have three extraordinary women, each with special insights and information to offer on the experience of the survivors of sexual assault as they journey through the Australian legal system and suggestions about what can be done to minimise the trauma, ensure that perpetrators are brought to justice and that society is made safer. Louise Milligan tackles these issues head on in her recent book, Witness, published by Hachette Australia, the culmination of five years work. Louise is an investigative journalist for ABC TV's Four Corners and author of the best-selling Cardinal, The Rise and Fall of George Pell. Cardinal won the 2017 Walkley Book Award and was highly commended in the Sisters in Crime 2018 Davitt Awards. Among the many awards for her work, Louise has received the 2019 Press Freedom Medal, the 2017 Melbourne Press Club's Gold Quill Award and the 2021 Quill Award. Welcome, Louise. With us also is Jane Patrick. Jane is a retired county court judge. She sat in the criminal division for 10 years and conducted a large number of sex offence hearings. Prior to her county court appointment, she was a magistrate for eight years dealing with many sex offence cases. Jane is also a member of Sisters in Crime. Welcome, Jane. Michelle Williams QC is chair of the Post Sentence Authority, a new independent statutory body established to monitor and supervise serious sex offenders and serious violent offenders who continue to be an unacceptable risk of committing a further serious offence once their sentence is completed. Michelle practised as a criminal barrister for 30 years. In 2002, she was appointed a Crown Prosecutor, taking silk in 2005. She became a Senior Crown Prosecutor the following year. In that same year, Michelle was appointed first head of the Specialist Sexual Offences Unit at the Office of Public Prosecutions, a newly formed unit in response to the Law Reform Commission's inquiry into the way victims of sexual offences have been treated in the criminal justice system. We have a lot of territory to cover tonight. We'll start with a question for Louise. Louise, witnesses described on the back cover of the book as a compelling call for change, referring to change within the criminal justice system. You make several references in the book to a need for change is the reason that you were driven to write it. Can you tell us about what change you see as necessary and what change you would like to see? I think that um, speaking to many victims, complainants of sexual crimes as I have, not just for my research for witness, but also over the past few years um, as an investigative journalist for the ABC and indeed for my work in, uh, in Cardinal, that um, really, the uh, criminal justice system is leaving people who come forward, who really summon up the courage to come forward to complain of these terrible crimes, leaving them feeling very bruised by the process. And in fact, one thing that they typically say, not just 
to me, but they have said to law reform commission inquiries, to the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse, to the Victorian um, Parliamentary Inquiry um, into, the, into the institutional sexual abuse issue, is that the criminal justice process, most particularly um, the process of cross-examination in court, was as bad, if not worse, than the original crime. Now, that's a pretty appalling indictment on the system. And I think a lot of the time that the practitioners who operate in the system, particularly defence counsel, find that really hard to believe. How could it possibly be as bad as, you know, child rape, for instance? But the point is that, that these people are, you know, by necessity, having to go through the granular and awful details of the crime, but also that they find that the process of being doubted is the sort of thing that they feared, the reason that they didn't come forward before if it was a historical crime. So many of them have this sense of guilt and shame and, and, and a sense that they were, if, especially when they were children, that they were somehow to blame for what happened to them. And, you know, there are lots of tropes in society about women being to blame for sexual crimes. And so then they find themselves in this environment where, you know, unlike the accused who, if well resourced, is sitting there with a silk and a junior and a, a, a solicitor and watching the entire proceedings, they come in just for their evidence. Often they're in a remote witness facility to protect them. They don't have the lawyer. They do have the Crown, but the Crown doesn't act for them. And depending on how the Crown is sort of playing the case, if they're playing a low profile case, it may be that they don't give the witness, um, the, the complainant very much preparation at all. And so they often describe this feeling of it's, it's like they're just being thrown to the lions, you know, and um, if they have a robust defence um, counsel who, you know, um, has a old school kind of way of, of pursuing this, it can be enormously re-traumatising. So, I mean, one of the things that I look at in witness is I, I think that there is a role for some form of legal representation for these complainants, um, not to make them a party, because of course they aren't a party to the proceedings. It's between the state and the accused. Um, and, and I don't think that the lawyer would probably be at the, the bar table, um, but, but certainly to be present in court because there are uh, provisions under the Evidence Act which prevent improper questioning. But a lot of the time, from what I've been told, you know, speaking to prosecutors, speaking to complainants and defence counsel, to judges, etc., cetera, um, is that um, sometimes these provisions in the, in the Evidence Act aren't actually enforced. Um, because as I said, the prosecutor is playing a low profile role. It depends on the judge. If the judge is, is not intervening as much as perhaps they should, um, the, the, play, the, the complaintive can, sorry, the complainant can feel incredibly alone. And often these sorts of issues defy transcript. So it's not something that you can necessarily see written down on paper. It's about the tone, the bullying kind of voice that is used. Um, the sarcasm, the sort of belittling kind of behaviour. I've seen it myself because I was cross-examined for a full day in the committal proceeding of um, Cardinal George Pell. And I, I don't want to go into that case because my book is not about that case. But the point is, it was an incredibly bruising experience for me. And I just kept thinking all the way through, I'm such a privileged person and... I'm not traumatised. I haven't gone on a sort of, you know, sad life trajectory because, you know, my life went off the rails after I was, you know, sexually abused as a child. Um, and, and so I, I do think that there's a role for an advocate of some sort to be able to intervene when 
the Evidence Act is clearly being breached and if no one else is, is intervening. Um, and I think it might also keep the prosecutors on their toes. I think it might keep the judicial officers on their toes as well. I mean, I think also one of the issues with judges, and certainly this is something that has been expressed to me, particularly by prosecutors, is that, and, and it has been discussed also in the Royal Commission and other fora, is that if you have a particularly bullying defence counsel, the judicial officer can get worn down because you know, every time they intervene, then the person does it again. And it just becomes a bit wearying and they become a bit worried about appeal points because there might be an apprehended bias and so on. Um, so yeah, I just think if we had another person in the room who could just keep an eye on things, but also who could prepare a complainant for this process, who could not coach them for their evidence because that's not proper, but to, to just give them a sense of what it's like because what people expressed to me, and particularly people who were teenagers when they uh, gave their evidence, is that they had no idea it was going to be what it was. I mean, Paris Street in the St. Kevin's case is a really good example. He was 15 years old. He thought he was going along to court to do the right thing, you know? He was doing his civic duty because his um, perpetrator, and, and the man was convicted, um, groomed him so didn't actually physically abuse him and Paris was concerned that he was going to physically abuse a, a, another child and this is why he came forward and it's why so many people come forward um, and um, and he got into that courtroom and the and the you know the tv and the remote witness facility snapped on and he was just horrified by what he was subjected to for the next two days. And, you know, he told me when, when the TV snapped off for the day that day, he just sobbed and he went home that night and, you know, it was like his little world had come kind of cr crashing down. You know, he was like this kid who was, um, you know, from a pr fairly privileged family, went to a private school, everything had gone pretty well for him as a straight A student. I could really relate to him. I remember being that kid at school, you know, you think that there's justice. You think that if you do the right thing, things will go well for you. Um, but they didn't for him in court, even though he got the conviction and he went home that night and he still has punch holes in his bedroom wall because he just couldn't believe how he was treated. And he had almost no preparation for that. And we can't do that to people. We can't do that to teenagers who are courageous enough to enter the system. I just don't think it's, it's acceptable at all. You can really hear the passion in your voice, Louise, and, and it's that passion that has driven you um, to write about this in your book. There's a lot of things that you've mentioned there and there's a lot to unpack. Um, if we can look at some of these issues one at a time, perhaps I might uh, put a question to Michelle. Um, Michelle Williams, you are a, a criminal barrister, a senior Crown prosecutor. Do you agree that there's a need for change? Well, as you said, uh, Louise has, um, yeah, covered a lot of uh, area in that opening answer, I suppose. Um, Look, what disappoints me, quite frankly, is that the same questions that you are posing, the same issues that uh, Louise has talked about, are the very same issues that we were attempting to address in 2006 when I was the first head of the Specialist Sex Offences Unit. It is completely unsatisfactory and disappointing that we are still talking about these same issues. However, let's roll back a little bit, a little bit, because 2006, as I say, when I was uh, head of that unit, there were many, many, many barristers who did not even conference the complainant at all, at all. And that was something that I changed, that I put into place, the reason being uh, we had inherited uh, the English system, which uh, meant that you didn't conference witnesses. You did not conference complainants. There was this fear or feeling or um, concern that somehow or other, if the barrister 
conference the complainant, that they would get caught up in the whole thing, that they would become a witness. So, you know, we have made progress. I do want to actually come back to that. It, it's, it's not as if we haven't made any progress. It might not seem like it, but we have. Is there more work to be done? Absolutely. And as I say, it is concerning that we are still talking about the same things. I mean, the 2004 Law, Law Reform Commission report was all about treating victims with respect, treating them with dignity. Um, you know, all the, the, the um, Evidence Act amendments and so on that, that eventually came through, you know, no, I'll call it the no bullying questions or the no intimidating questions, those so sorts of questions that, um, you know, um, the complainants find really difficult and should not be allowed. Why are they being allowed? We have to ask ourselves that question. Why is that still happening when we have an act that says it shouldn't be happening? Now, from my point of view, there's, as I say, there's quite a few issues to unpack, um, which Louise has raised. But um, first of all, I do think it starts with the prosecutors. That is my view. Um, if witnesses are, and we're talking about complainants here, but any witness needs to be prepared properly to give their evidence. That does not mean meet them five minutes before the committal. Um, now, the committal is another thing. I, I think personally there should be pre-recorded evidence for complainants so that they give their evidence in uh, a way, uh, and we do that for children, why not for all um, adult victims as well? Um, so that's something that could be done. There, there are still things that can be done, uh, but look at what shouldn't be done in order to have a better system, everybody needs to actually learn to follow the rules. Um, it's no good having these rules and no one follows them. So the prosecutor, in my view, ought to be the one that it starts with. And the judicial officer, whoever is sitting, must assist in that way. Um, it is tricky for them, I think, for the judges to constantly uh, having to intervene or to stop a barrister who is asking inappropriate questions. That's why I say it must be the prosecutor that does it. So in my practice and what I try to encourage others to do, bear in mind, um, people are independent barristers. You can, um, you know, there are ways and means, but at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's their role to act the way that uh, they can. But what I used to encourage and what I used to do myself is that I would set a t aside a time to have a proper conference with my witnesses, usually the week before. So leading up to the committal, if there was one, or the trial. And, um, you know, that's not just about, and you mentioned the word coaching, uh, Louise. It is not about coaching, but it is about expectations. Expectations. Mm. And what is this system about? Because, and again, you mentioned Paris Street and that he thought he was, he had no idea. He was just coming along. Well, that is unacceptable and that should not have happened. And, you know, so if prosecutors, um, and as I say, I believe it's the prosecutor's role. I don't particularly go for the idea of independent representation. I know it's been looked at or, or is being looked at, but my own, that's got a number of problems attached to it. And, um, you know, it would be very difficult, I think, for someone who has legal representation to then not be attacked. I mean, how, how do you have confidentiality, for example? How does the defence barrister cross-examine? Have you been told that by your independent um, representation? I think it creates more problems than it solves, uh, whereas it is the prosecutor who knows his or her case and what it is that they want uh, or need for the witness or the complainant to get the evidence out to prove the case. At the end of the day, and this is, you know, if we're assuming we still have the same criminal justice system, the Crown do need to prove the case. It's their case. Uh, uh, can I just say something in follow-up to that that I think is quite interesting? Um, I did find with uh, female prosecutors that they seem to have more of a, you know, sense that they should be intervening in, and also a sense that they should be properly conference, conferencing 
uh, complainants. They were very passionate about that. Um, and I'm not quite sure, you know, why there is a sort of a, a gender sort of issue there. But it, yes, if, if they were doing their jobs properly, then perhaps we wouldn't need an independent lawyer. But the point is, <laughs> they're clearly not because people are still feeling like this. And we're in the middle now of another Law Reform Commission inquiry yeah. into this issue. The Victorian government has deemed it necessary to do this yet again, to come back yet again. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's really great and really important for people like you, Michelle, to say these things um, because your voice is one that people will listen to. Let, let's, hear from, let's hear from Jane Patrick, um, retired County Court judge. Jane, you have presided over a large number of sex offence hearings. Um, I, I'm interested to hear, do the experiences described by Louise in her book Witness reflect the reality of the criminal justice system in this area? And, and where do you see a need for change? Um, well, I, Louise has spoken the truth, so there's no doubt that what she says happens. I think I'd be interested to see what the Law Reform Commission says because I understand that they are looking at transcripts of lots of cases. Louise is right that you can't always tell from the transcript how things were put. A um, couple of things. Things have changed enormously since when I started. Um, respect and dignity were absolute values in my court always. And I disagree with Michelle in the sense that it's always the judge who ultimately has the responsibility to make sure that that happens. Things changed a lot in the time that I was on the bench. And I always tried to do what I could to make sure that the experience was as least traumatic as possible. I didn't always get it right. And the Court of Appeals told me I didn't get it right. <laughs> yeah, but um, I did try really hard. And it, there are a few things that are, are difficult about it. Um, one is that I think get cross-examined in any by anybody in any case is, is tough. I've known lawyers go weak at the knees at the prospect of being cross-examined. So it's hard anyway. For people who are survivor victims of sexual offence situations, it's much worse because they've got to, excuse me, be talking about things that are quite difficult. I didn't have overall much experience of people trawling through details. Certainly any extensive cross-examination of the sort that I think you were subject to, uh, Louise, shouldn't, wouldn't have gone on in my court, as far as I'm concerned. Um, some judges are more interventionist than others. One of the problems that you have to remember that occurs is we've got jury trials. If you keep stopping to tell a barrister that they're, they're out of order, you have to send the jury out if you're going to say anything meaningful to them, if they don't stop. In other words, if you say... Uh, Mr. Jones, can you move to the next question? And Mr. Jones doesn't, then you ultimately have to send the jury out and have an argument with them about, not an argument, but you've got to tell them what they're doing that's wrong and ask them to correct. And it can be quite disruptive. And I think probably I tried, one thing is that we've done a lot of work with children to try and make things better for children. I'd be very interested to hear what the witness protection, uh, the witness service, not witness protection, the, the, the people that assist the child witnesses in, to, you know, in, in those remote witness facilities, they have a huge amount of knowledge about how people are feeling at the other end, how the complainants are feeling when they're cross-examined and how they come out at the other end. I'd be very interested in, because you need a cross section of what's going on everywhere. Now, some things bad are clearly happening in some places. Is that a reflection of what, how much percent is bad? Are things improving? What, it, what are the things that make things improve? More judicial education, very good thing. I think the, um, the issue of an independent um, person assisting the witness is technically possible, but I think, again, funding would be a problem. And I think the other thing is the disruptive element about it. How would you handle it in, when you've got people in a remote witness facility, you've got people in the court, you've got the accused there, you've got a jury. And the jury is very important in these matters. I'll stop. <laughs> Can I say on the question of the remote witness facility, I, I did speak to a number of, um, you know, victims and complainants who, 
who actually wanted to be in the court and felt quite sort of removed from the process. I feel like the system kind of infantilizes victims. It's like this kind of there, there sort of approach. And, um, you know, if they were in the court but had more purchase, you know, um, and, and that's why I thought the idea of a, an advocate of sorts would be good because they would feel more empowered. Um, it, it might be a less, um, as I say, infantilizing and patronizing and brutalizing experience for them. I know that the reason that the remote witness facilities were brought in was actually to protect them. Um, but sometimes there's sort of almost this ghostly presence that sort of wafts no. above. Disagree. Disagree with that entirely. Yes, I do too, Louise. I think it's been the single most, um, you know, um, reform, that's progressive reform that's helped the system. And you've got to remember that some, uh, some complainants simply cannot, cannot give their evidence. They, they simply can't. Now, it is true, I think um, there, in my experience, have been some who have said, I'd prefer to go into the courtroom. And of course they can. Yeah. But there's nothing more powerful in my view than you have a great big screen there with a, with a person who is um, speaking and telling, uh, are talking about things that have happened to them. The jury see that. Um, they, it's, it's uh, the technology. Um, I don't know, Jane. You're, you're you know, you've been closer uh, in terms of time to this than me. But my experience, Jane, was the technology was terrific, and that uh, it was as if the person was in the courtroom anyway. So I, I don't agree either. I think it's um, been a very, and in fact, my view is that. Uh, complainants uh, would be in a better position if all of their evidence was pre-recorded and played to a jury. We've had very, very good success with that, um, with child uh, witnesses, uh, child complainants, and um, it's it's technology that's available. Just to I make just yes, to make sorry. that clear, that's evidence in chief that's pre-recorded, so there'd still yes. be cross examination. Yeah, yeah. So I so might just I, move I, on. I, hmm. Sorry, go on, Louise. I was just going to say that um, I think I think that the that the accused should be removed instead of the instead of the witness instead of the complainant, and and if the same sort of um, judicial direction was given to the jury, you know, you're not to make anything of the fact that the accused is out during the, the complainant's evidence. This happens in every case. Um, then it would be a far less intimidating experience for the complainant to, you know, to sort of be in that room. Well, again, I don't, I, I, I don't agree with that because you're then talking about a different system. And if you want to talk about a, a totally different system, we can do that. We can yeah. talk about that. And maybe there's room for that, you know. Um, but, you know, the system is there. This is These are very serious matters that an accused is faced with. And the system says we need to be fair to the accused. At the end of the day, whether anybody likes it or not, the victim is a witness. It is not his or her case. And in order to um, give their evidence, it's about how is the best way that that person can give their evidence, whether they're a child or an adult. And it's just as intimidating, or would be in my view, to come into a courtroom full of, uh, uh, you know, the jury, the judge, the tip staff, the barristers. The accused, in a way, is almost oblivious anyway because they're at the back of the back of the courtroom. So I, I don't think, Louise, it would make um, the difference that you're suggesting, and I think it uh, is would be a different system then, which you know maybe that's what we need. Maybe at the end of the day, we're trying to, you know, put, what's that saying, put a square peg in, in, in a round hole because uh, really there's a fundamental conflict, isn't there, between the accused right to a fair trial and what we're trying to say, well, you know, a complainant or a witness in a sexual assault matter is uh, feeling or is experiencing, and we're not doubting that, we know that. Um, the trauma of what they're going through. Are those two things fundamentally in conflict? And I think they probably are. Mm. Well, many of them have 
said to me that, you know, that they felt like they were on trial, not the accused. Of course. Of course. I mean, I, it's a cliche, right? It's a cliche, but yeah. it's a cliche for a reason. You know? It's a cliche for a reason because it's true and because yeah. many, many um, victims uh, say that. But I think the other thing is what, what maybe is not being said here is that the reforms have led to people coming out and feeling more comfortable in reporting. Of course, it is still true that many do not come out for a long time and are not able to, but they are supported through to make the complaint, to make the, to the police in the first instance. So I do think there's been, you know, can, remember Jane when there used to be the, you, you know, you never you had to have the un, um, corrupt, you had to have corroborated evidence. Mm. For, it was never approved at the um, Victoria Police level. You never got a charge to court mm. unless there was, well, how many, <laughs> very rare that you have corroboration, meaning independent uh, evidence that supports uh, mm. what the complainant is saying. So um, anyway, we, I, I do think we've made some progress, but it's, it's where to from here. Mm. Seems to to me that um, a lot of what uh, Louise is talking about is coming from a, a um, position of um, thinking of empowering um, the complainant and Louise has used this phrase empowerment a lot. Just to, to segue a little bit now, in, in the book Witness, there's part of, um, part of the book about a particular barrister whose performance in court was so extreme that uh, the victim wrote about this in her victim impact statement. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Impact statement obviously being one form of um, empowerment. But that part of the statement was actually disallowed from being read aloud in court. Michelle, I know that Louise interviewed you about this for the book. Um, can you give us comments about whether a victim or a family member making a comment about the style of a barrister in the actual victim impact statement, is that, uh, is that something that should be allowed? Well, in many respects, I think it should be allowed because we're talking about the way um, a, a trial is conducted and, and the effect on uh, the complainant during the course of that trial, and if it's had, uh, you know, a very um, significant effect, then there, there could be reason uh, to to allow it. I'm not sure, Jane, did you ever have that? And do, and do you think it should be? Um, I would certainly allow it. I think yeah. you'd have to have a discussion. The, the thing is that victim impact statements are not done until after there's a conviction. So they're done between the time of conviction and time of sentence. So there's quite a lot of history that a person's gone through by that yeah. stage. Yeah. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to, because what they're talking about is the impact of the crime on them. So part of the impact may very well be the process and what was wrong with the process from there or what, how it traumatized them or how it was stressful. Um, and I think that's perfectly reasonable to allow that. And I think you then might need in the circumstance a discussion with the barrister uh, peering the prosecutor as to how that was going to be relied upon in terms of sentencing or whatever, but that's okay. Victim impact statements are an opportunity for a victim to tell how the whole, the crime has impacted on them. And this is part of the impact, I think. I yeah, yeah, I agree. In this particular case, it was actually the victim's mother. So uh, as it happened, she had also been 30 years before or something, a victim herself of a sexual crime and had been through the process and was horrified to see that, you know, in her estimation, that nothing had changed, that there was still this... Um, you know, very, very robust and, you know, she would kind of argue bullying kind of behaviour going on in the court. Um, yeah, I mean, it was... That, that might make it a slightly different because yeah. you, do get, you do get statements from relatives, um, but they really should be focusing on their perception of the impact on the, on the um, complainant. And if they start providing what might be psychological 
Yeah, but oh, it's, it's different. no, no, no. She she was talking about the impact on her daughter. That's yeah. just the backstory to yeah. why yeah. she, you know, she she just talked about she just couldn't believe that her daughter in this day and age was being treated in the way that she was and that it had contributed significantly to the trauma that she experienced going through that process. Um, and, you know, she wrote very sort of passionately about it. It was interesting. I, I did interview the barrister about, about this and, um, you know, he, he's very sort of um, unabashed about his, you know, old school kind of style. Like he, he's very upfront about that. And, and I remember he said, well, you know, so what? I hope that Collingwood wins the premiership. Bad luck, I, you know, I, that doesn't happen. You know, and I, I was just like, wow. You know, I, I honestly don't think the barristers you interviewed are typical of the barristers that appear no. in sex offence trials in Victoria day in, day out. I guess the point is, though, that those barristers do do sex trials. They do do a lot of sex trials. And in that particular case, that person does a lot of sex trials himself, right? He does no, do them. He doesn't do that many. <laughs> well, but but he does. He, this was a high profile case. There and are he people does that do them. them. And, and he and he's talked about it in the media like quite frequently. Um, I mean, the bottom line is still happening. The, the the victims and their families are still very distressed by it. Oh, yeah. And I agree with you that there are cool. lots of really, you know, um, considered uh, excellent practitioners who who don't adopt that kind of style and that there are other ways to you know skin a cat that you know to achieve a forensic purpose and in fact some would argue and 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 many barristers I spoke to for the book said this that um that it's actually counterproductive to 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 act in that way that jurors don't like it and so on um but the point is that you know there are still these guys and they are generally guys who think that that is effective and and the bottom line is there are victims on the other side of that and you know i spoke to a a, a psychologist who who deals only with victims of sexual crimes and you know, she she said it takes people years to get over it, um, and you know, people are self harming and making suicide attempts and so on after going through this process. And I know myself, like how I felt having gone through that process with a very very robust practitioner who is renowned for behaving in that sort of way. Um, it was a, an almost a physical trauma that, I mean, I wasn't sort of like sitting there the next day going, oh, he said this and then he said that and then he said that. I was just buzzing with anxiety um, and underlying that anxiety was thinking about people who are so much less fortunate than me and thinking about how devastating it would have been for them and and you know one of those people said to me um I would tell any victim it's not worth it don't come forward now we can't have that happening you know because what does that mean if if people get that message and we know that we have low reporting rates we have low conviction rates for this category of crime compared to other similar categories what does that mean it means that perpetrators get away with it it means that these blokes think that they can continue to behave in this way and at the moment we're having a national conversation in this country um, about these sorts of issues i've got a question i might put first to jane our adversarial system is by its very nature a contest Louise says in her book, rightly or wrongly, our legal system is set up to require defence lawyers to discredit the complainant, that is, a person who alleges sexual abuse. Is it time to think about changing the adversarial system, in, especially in this area of sexual abuse cases? Would an inquisitorial system be better? Jane? I've thought about this over the years a lot, and I think one thing... Um... I've been thinking about is could it be done that way my experience for example in vocat victims of crime assistance tribunal is that one of the most important things is that the balance of proof is on the balance of probabilities and generally people's 
uh, who make a complaint of this sort or say these sorts of things happen, are uh, they're, they're validated in the sense that they're, what they say is accepted. And there isn't this whole business of sort of trying to say, well, it didn't happen, therefore I have to discredit you by somebody else. It just goes through and therefore there's whatever, not very much, but some assistance that's given through that system. But I was wondering whether that model could in any way be applied. I think, and I would like to see some aspect of that. I think the Law Reform Commission's looking at some of that. Um, the only problem is the consequences. If, if I, they're very serious crimes that we're looking at. I don't want to give up a perpetrator being sent to jail, frankly. I suppose as a judge, I kind of think punishment's a thing that we do. <laughs> it's a consequence for bad behaviour and it has all sorts of reasons, but as a moral thing, I think it's a, it's an important strength of the system. And I don't want those people not to be punished if it's possible to do it in a way that is not so traumatic for victims and complainants. Um, but if you're going to have someone being sent to jail, I think then that change, I don't think, well, there are countries which do and have inquisitorial systems, which end up with people being sent to jail. Um, some of them are moving more towards adversarial systems. Um, maybe we can learn something from them about how it's done. But I think I gather, for example, in France that, you know, delay is a big problem. I think delay is one of the most awful things. It's apart from the cross-examination, which is awful. Perhaps I can add something to that because it may be, <clears throat> pardon me, that it is time to look at uh, a different system because it does seem to me there is a fundamental conflict between uh, an accused person's right to a fair trial and uh, treating a complainant fairly and with dignity and, you know, um, with an appropriate expectation, I suppose. The, the problem is exactly as Jane pointed out, um, it's been looked at before in terms of the um, a restorative justice model as well. Um, in other words, uh, is that a better way to go forward for, for victims to, um, to be able to have an acknowledgement that the crime was committed against them and to have uh, uh, an accused person say, I did it, I admit it, I'm sorry. But the consequences of a serious crime are jail and that would not happen in that case. So how do you marry the very serious crime of rape and a simple apology? Clearly, that is those two things don't sit together either. So I think there's a number of propositions and a number of conflicts that we need to consider if we want to have a better system. Um, yes, I'm not too sure where the Law Reform Commission is with this at the moment, but um, yeah, some of these things could be looked at again. I know in 2004, um, or thereabouts with the Law Reform Commission there, and the Attorney General was looking at the restorative justice system, but it did not um, meet with favour um, at that time because of that conflict with the seriousness of the crime and uh, an expectation that uh, the person who does commit that crime needs to be punished, and uh, uh, usually with jail if it's, uh, if it's a, a offence of rape or an offence against children. So, but I, I, look, at the end of the day, the fact that we're talking about this must be a good thing. The fact that we're saying, how do we achieve this? What is the best way forward for the victims? Um, and I'm sorry, I keep calling them victims. Sexual assault survivors uh, is probably the appropriate word. Um, no one really has the exact right answer for that, but... Uh, it's good that we've explored a lot of the issues today and we'll keep exploring them. I, I think the public discourse is really important. And I think books like Louise's are really, really important. It, it changes public attitudes and that change, and it changes yeah. attitudes of judicial officers. It changes attitudes of participants in the system. Yeah. Um, public attitudes do change. And that was evident in juries from the times of the Royal Commission, in my opinion. People used to make, defence barristers would make arguments that, oh, as if this person would have done that, you know, they're a noble upstanding person in the community as if they would have committed this horrible act to somebody in that circumstance. And 
juries would accept that argument, in, but they stopped accepting it once it became so well known that people did all these really awful things in all sorts of bizarre, effectively, circumstances. That's exactly, and, uh, that, that that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right, Jane. That was also my experience when I first started to practice, that that was the common thing, as if that would happen, as if they wouldn't tell someone, as if. Why didn't they tell them? This couldn't have happened, they didn't. And that was commonly accepted. So, which goes back to what I said earlier, we have made progress. It's We just haven't made enough progress. Enough. I've got another question leading on from that, which stems from the fact that Louise has been in a, a unique position to write this book. Um, she's a, an investigative journalist, but she also has a law degree. And she comes to this from a position of, of knowledge. But she's not a practicing lawyer. So she's been able to write this book, sort of lawyers who have a lot to say about this subject. But lawyers have a duty not to bring the profession into disrepute. Do you think that this adherence to this duty stops many lawyers from speaking out about problems in the criminal justice system? I might go to Jane first. Um, no, I don't think it's that's the problem. I think some of them don't want to be seen to be criticising the system, but I think you'd be surprised how many people do say something and how many judicial officers do say something. How many people, well, I know I did. I know lots of, lots of the things that change, change because judicial officers pushed for them to change and people like Michelle and other practitioners, lots of people um, pushed for change, not necessarily in public view um, and maybe people should say something more in public view, but um, I accept that. But, you know, I've made submissions, various people have all sorts of things. So I think people do, um, as long as it's done, you know, respectfully and sort of in an appropriate way. What do you think, Michelle? Yes, I, I agree with that. And um, I think we're both um, reflecting on, uh, you know, how far we have come. It doesn't seem like it, but when when, as I say, I, I first practised and, uh, the, you know, what went on there to what goes on. Uh, now, the judicial officers, I think, in particular, you know, we have um, uh, specialist lists, um, you know, magistrates, uh, judges and so on, um, all coming out of the 2004 Law Reform Commission. So, um, yeah, there has been progress. I, I think... Um, the question that you asked, Rachel, I, I don't think it's really, um, it's not that, you know, barristers have too much to say. We all want to have an opinion. We all say what we, what we you know, but I think there is a general, we don't get into the public forum or we haven't. Those who practice generally don't. Um, yeah. And that has been the beauty, if you like, of Louise's book, to put this in the public forum, um, to make people aware, to look at um, from a journalist's uh, view um, and, um, you know, um, an educated view, as you say, and uh, through experience, looking at uh, critically, critically, the criminal justice system. And we do and should do that. Um, you know, generally the, the wheels of the criminal justice system or the legal system move very slowly um, and that is part of the problem. Yeah. I'd like to give Louise just one, the last sort of final comment by, by this question. Louise, your book has the subtitle An Investigation into the Brutal Cost of Seeking Justice. It's clearly identifiable as a work of investigative journalism. And we know that you spent five years conducting the investigation that led to the production of this book. Can you talk to us a bit about the actual personal investment as a writer in writing this book? Um, well, it was a personal sort of experience from the start I suppose because the reason that I wanted to write this book was because I you know I, I had that experience of giving evidence and how I felt about it and I it was quite a you know almost politicizing experience for me um, going through that and and I remember thinking that you know after 
this whole case had finished and and after I, frankly I had recovered from not just um, the primary experience of of going through that but also the secondary trauma that ultimately comes from you know um, telling I suppose these stories without wanting to make myself the victim in this because I'm not at all but um, that I would try and find out more about what was happening to victim survivors complainants in the system and and one of the issues is because um, because the evidence is often given in camera and and these cases are often not covered by journalists unless they're very high profile ones um, we don't hear these stories we don't see these transcripts um, and and so that's why I sort of wanted to do it but um but yeah, it is um, it is a sort of a deeply sort of personal sort of experience, and and you know the other thing about the barristers, I mean, I loved talking to them because journalists and barristers, I think we're all very simpatical. Like you know, we we're similar types of characters, um, and 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 I really appreciated their um, honesty and their candor, and and you know the fact that they talked all actually about their own trauma. And the fact that um, they talked about how that could perhaps be better managed for for them, um, and 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 that if that was the case, that might also lead to some change and some empathy and so on. Um, so be bringing in no alcohol. <laughs> yeah, well, alcohol is definitely a thing that came up a lot, <laughs> um, and you know, no judgment here. No. But um, but but. Uh, you know, in, in all seriousness, um, one thing that has been really, really validating about, you know, publishing this book is I have heard from lawyers around the country, barristers and solicitors, who have taken on board, you know, that, you know, there are areas that we can change. And, and as I say, this is not saying in any way that there haven't been lots of you know, there hasn't been a lot of thought that's gone into this, that there's not a lot of good work that's being done. There are not, you know, responsible judges, fantastic Crown prosecutors, sensitive um, defence counsel um, who, who, you know, do this in, in, in the way that it should be done. But on the other side of it is these people who, who are still telling these stories and, and, you know, we have to listen to them. Um, and, you know, I, I have seen up close the impact that it's had on these people and um, I'll never forget it. Like they're in my heart, you know, and I'm sure they're in the hearts of people like, you know, you as well. Um, you can't forget these these terrible stories and the pain that these people sort of go through um and and I just want to make it better for them I just you know I want to make this system better I don't want to see another kid like Paris Street you know um because you know I keep in contact with him and six years down the track you know He's marked by all of this, not just the criminal justice system, also the institutional betrayal by his school and, of course, the crime in, in the first place. But, um, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, we, we, we've just got to do better by these people because they're so brave. I'm so impressed by them. You know, um, it's, a, it's a really hard thing to talk about these, these crimes and most people don't do it. Most people just think it's too hard. Um, well, that's the awful thing, isn't it? The mm. ones that who are brave enough, who do come forward, and then the system re-traumatises them. So, um, yeah, we do need to find a way, a better way. Um, mm. It's just I'm not sure what that is at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, it, Marcia Neve actually, when I was talking to her, was saying, you know, like, it, it would be good to see more international comparisons, you know, more 
work on on that sort of stuff there hasn't yeah. been as much as there could be and then that would include you know well what are the conviction rates you know comparative data yeah. all of that sort of stuff look I, I do that- I do think too what I didn't mention before which I would like to mention is that having a specialist sex offences unit was really very powerful at the time because we were not only um going forward and 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 treating victims uh with you know respect and dignity and and i was having all sorts of um uh, seminars for barristers to to educate them and and so on but we were driving outcomes it's important to think about driving outcomes and what i mean by that is that in a lot of cases um a plea of guilty does um you know, drive an outcome for a victim and an accused. And to do that and to achieve that at an early stage um, is, I think, a really desirable... If, again, if we're talking about we're working within the same system, the criminal justice system more or less as it is, then I would actually re-advocate for having the Specialist Sex Offences Unit set up again because it was disbanded some years after I left. Um, so to me, I cannot understand why. Well, look, I cannot you know, understand it. You know, <laughs> I'm not sure why either. But I'll just talk about one case I had, and I, I think I can talk about it without identifying the parties. Um, but it was in the children's court, funnily enough, and it was um, eleven young offenders who had, um, let's say, sexually abused a young girl, and they, of course, were because they were young offenders and stupid, they videoed. And, uh, you know, first of all, the police didn't know what to charge these young offenders with. Second, the father did not want his daughter to go through uh, what he rightly knew would be a dreadful experience for her. I was able to drive an outcome, which was a plea of guilty from all of those offenders by saying to each and every barrister, um, come to my chambers, talk to me about this, go into a room with your client, watch the video and tell me what you're going to do. And if you plead guilty, I will make a submission to the judge that they do not have to go to jail or to youth training centre. It was an amazing experience. I'm giving you the short, short version of it, but it took a long time to actually, it was a great outcome for the for the victim and her parents. Who uh, she was, um, you know, intellectually um, uh, slow. I will say, I'll call it that way. Um, and of course, they didn't want to put her through the system. It had an um, oh, oh, sorry, I had a few conditions attached to it. That each uh, young offender uh, had to plead guilty, and it was to an appropriate charge and um, a rolled up charge. And their parents had to come into court and watch that video while it was played in court. I want their parents to see what those offenders have done. This had an amazing outcome. You know, everybody, it was a win for everybody, everybody. The offenders didn't go to jail. The um, the victim didn't have to give evidence. Uh, the father was happy with that outcome. Uh, the police were happy because they didn't have a clue what they were going to charge these offenders with. So that's a really that's an example of what I mean by driving a case. Now you need a lot of energy to do that, and you need, in my view, it's helpful to have a dedicated unit. Or you don't have to, but I, I I found it was helpful that that's the sort of work we were able to achieve. These stories are all so fascinating and um, it's only through telling stories that we that we can share ideas and share some change for the system. One thing I do think is important that we need to emphasise is that um, com- complainants giving evidence, it can be an enormously validating experience and you know, the voices of women and children and, you know, victims of these sorts of crimes, you know, way back in the past, we didn't hear those voices. That's right. You know, this, yeah. this process can be an opportunity to empower them. So if the system is 
better geared towards that, this can be an incredibly um, cathartic process for them and, and can be an opportunity to, to get this stuff off their chest, you know, because a, a lot of people have said to me, um, or there's one survivor in Ballarat, a really lovely man, Peter Blenkine, who, who told me that, you know, it's like the pimple pops and then you just want to tell everyone, you want to shout it from the rooftops, you want it to be known that this happened to you. Well, if we can do that in a system where, you know, um, they are treated with a bit more respect and I accept that there are lots of situations where that does happen now, um, that would be good because, you know, I don't yeah. want to discourage anyone from coming yeah. forward. Louise, I couldn't agree more. And in my experience, there were um, many uh, victims of sexual assault who, after proper conferencing, after being prepared, after going through it, have and did say to me afterwards, you're right, Michelle, I actually do feel better for having said it. And I do think... Uh, Let's, let's try and encourage that part of it, empowering people to be able to uh, tell their stories and try and minimise or get rid of the other part of it where they're uh, treated uh, in an improper way. That's the system we want. And hats off to those people in the system who are doing it right, you know. I mean, let's not yeah. forget this is a really, really difficult process for prosecutors, for judges, for defence counsel, for solicitors, you know, they have to walk this road as well. And many of them are doing it in a very respectful way. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's a difficult thing for everyone. Um, so, you know, we should applaud where that's being done well as well. Yeah. It's wonderful that uh, we've been able to have the three of you talking today to, to talk through these ideas I think we could spend hours talking about this. There's so much more to be said, but we are going to have to finish that now, I think. So thank you very much to all of you for, for joining into such a fascinating conversation um, about a really, really important book. So thank you very much to you all. Thank you, Thanks. Louise. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Michelle. Bye. Thanks, Jane. Thank and you. Louise. Bye. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the participants. Thank you to our audience. You can buy Louise Milligan's book, Witness, from Sisters in Crime's longtime supporter, The Sun Bookshop, which now has an online service. The Sisters in Crime YouTube channel, um, have a look at that, where you can find other events, plus our Murder Mondays interviews with both Australian and overseas crime authors, including Val McDermott, Kathy Reich, Sarah Paretsky, and Anne Cleves. Keep in touch with Sisters in Crime through their website, and you can sign up for our monthly e-newsletter, A Stab in the Dark, or better still, join. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you, everyone. Stay strong, stay safe, and keep reading. Mm -hmm.